flight of it down, that was a really warm reception. I, actually, I was in school plays as well at primary school, and one of them, one of them we did Robin Hood, and I was one of Robin Hood's merry men. <laughs> Rob him from the rich and take him to the poor. <laughs> Things don't change. <laughs> All right, let me. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes or so, and I said to Fran, if I, if I go on for too long, just cut me down for a minute. So we'll have a QA session proper. Let me just explain where we're at at the moment and the job that we've all got to do in, in the coming months. Um, I, I'm a natural pessimist on these things. I, I've been working on the basis that the Tories will cling on to office for as long as they possibly can. And they're good at that. They're good at that. Um, but they're not in power. They're not in power. At the moment in Parliament, David will tell you later on today, we're largely on one-line whips because there's no parliamentary business other than Brexit and we've, we've moved beyond the first stage of the Brexit. And literally there's hardly any business. In fact, on Monday there was one piece of legislation on offence of weapons that looked like serious business, but they had to pull because they couldn't get the DUP to vote for it. So at the moment, we're in a situation of almost stasis, almost paralysis in Parliament. And it's interesting, and the reason for that paralysis is because Theresa May can't be sure of getting anything through her own cabinet, certainly can't be sure of getting stuff through her own party on the back, through the back benches. And then of course, as, as on Monday, the DUP exercised a veto over all, all parliamentary business. I've been in Parliament 21 years, I've, we've never seen anything like this before. And literally, they're beginning to fall apart. But up until now, I've literally been pessimistic and think they're going to go the full period, because of the nature of the Tories themselves, but also because of the way in which the new legislation prevents the opportunities for changing the government. But for the first time now, I'm beginning to think they may well fall apart. And the reason for that is because the Tories begin to hate each other more than they hate us. <laughs> and everywhere you go in Parliament, in every dark corner, there's a group of Tories plotting against one another. <laughs> um, it reminds me of the old Labour Party. <laughs> How it was. So it could happen. It could happen. We could have a general election and anything could trigger it, but certainly the disputes over Brexit could trigger it as well. So we've got to be prepared. So the exercise we're going through at the moment in terms of what's happening in, in Parliament is that for the Parliamentary Labour Party now, we're, and through the Shadow Cabinet, we're taking every element, we're using the last year's manifesto as the foundation of the development of the new manifesto. We're looking at every policy within that manifesto Preparing, we're asking the individual shadow cabinet teams to prepare implementation manuals for each one of those policies. My team are then doing the detailed costings again, upgrading the costings from the grey book that we published alongside the manifesto last year. And then we're moving to the stage of draft legislation, and trying to get as much on the shelf as we possibly can. And that's the old manifesto, but then looking at how we radicalise that with new ideas, and we go through the same exercise of developing policy implementation manual, costings, funding source, draft legislation, wherever is necessary. And we're now moving towards a further debate around, therefore, what will go into the first Green Speech and what will go into the first Budget. Before the last election, we were ready to go. We were meeting with the civil servants and on the first Budget, we had met with the Treasurer, the HMRC, and we were ready with the first Budget to go after the election in May. We were ready to have the first Budget by July than the first finance bill by October. Now we're planning on that same sort of time scale at the moment. So getting our ideas together and making sure that everything's ready for, to hit the deck running when we go into government. And I'm confident that we will go to government. This isn't arrogance. I'm just saying at the moment I'm confident we are. And the reason I'm confident is this, is that if you remember before the last general election we were 24 points behind, and I said then that I believe that we could win, that we would draw level certainly in the um, campaign itself and then go beyond. Everyone thought I was on drugs, um, but actually we drew level and we were on 38.2% of the vote. And I think if the election had gone on, campaign had gone another couple of weeks, we would be in government at the moment. And it was that sort of time scale that we needed. 
And the reason that we, um, we, drew, we got that level of support was the biggest surge in political support for any political party since the Atlee government was elected. And it was because of the manifesto itself. Um, rang, I think it rang true for the, addressing the issues in people's everyday lives. And in addition to that, we were able to ensure that by at least some semblance of balanced cover, coverage in the broadcast media, um, required by law, people actually saw the real Jeremy Corbyn, the honest principal, um, courageous individual that he is. And that took us to 38 points. So we were told then that that was peak Corbyn and that we would <laughs> start falling back. We've consolidated that base and the opinion polls now are anything between 38 points and 44 points and that's been consistent throughout the last year now. We're accused of, by some of our opponents of saying, well, we should be miles in advance. Well, actually, Brexit has hung over everything at the moment. And I think once we near some elements of Brexit decisions, maybe, and we get back on the domestic agenda, that's when we'll be able to get a surge. And certainly during a general election period, we think we can pick up the four or five additional points that we need to take us into government. And that's just trying to look at it as objectively as I possibly can. Well, why am I confident about that? It's, but it is, you know, it's like Clinton said, Clinton's people, it is the economy stupid. It overrides everything at the moment. And the, the experience of the economy for most people at the moment is one of uncertainty, insecurity, and tragically for many people, absolute deprivation as well. And I think we're on the cusp of something really significant. And it's the cusp of the breakdown of neoliberal Hegemony, you know, that concept of hegemony, I like quoting Gramsci, it upsets the Daily Mail so <laughs> That concept of hegemony, an idea that actually so dominates, it transforms your language and thinking about how you address the world. I think we're on the edge of the breakdown of the hegemony of neoliberalism after the last 40 years, which dominated economic, political economic thinking and political, political economic practice as well. And it's because the real world is intruding it and people no longer accept the theory of neoliberalism. The theory of neoliberalism is straightforward, you know it as well as I do. It's basically trickle-down economics. Now, first of all, that you cut the taxes to the rich and the corporations, so somehow, you, by making them more wealthy, this wealth will somehow trickle down to others. And at the same time, you have a concept that private is always better than public in terms of delivery of services. The market, the hidden hand of the market, will always produce the best optimum results and the only, the only thing that's standing in its way is some impediments like trade union rights or regulation of finance etc. So you have to remove trade union rights and you have to remove that regulation. Well that system has significantly failed and people are waking up to that reality now because it's, it's produced 4 million children that are currently living in poverty. 4 million and rising at the moment. It's produced 5,000 people now sleeping on our streets. In the sixth richest country in the world, we have 5,000 people sleeping on our streets. And do you know what? If anything could bring it home to people, you know, within the doors, within feet of the doors of Parliament, only six months ago, we had a homeless person die. We've had housing lists now expanding in such a way that actually some people now on those housing lists have faced no prospect of getting a decent roof over their heads. We've got cuts in our education and our schools for the first time on a scale per pupil since the 1990s. And you've seen the winter crisis now in the NHS has become a permanent crisis. And wages are still below the level of 2010. All of that, I think, is impacting upon people's daily lives. And as a result of that, there's an incredulity about the system. There's an incredulity about the system operating for them. And there's a lack of confidence in what is being said by particularly Tory ministers and others that somehow life is improving. And it's interesting, you know, when, we, when you go through a recession, people expect people to react when you're at the bottom of the recession. It first hurt, hits people, whether it's in the depression of the 30s or whether it was the recession that was caused by the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. It isn't at the, it isn't at the bottom of a recession when people react. That's when people... Actually, all of their energies are focused on survival. Now it's when they're told somehow the rules coming out of the recession, and they see actually they're not sharing in any of those benefits that people start questioning the system itself. So we're at that, I think we're all at that key fundamental stage that basically it's, it, people are questioning 
actual system itself and they're demanding change. And I think they're demanding radical change as well. So this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity for us now to, to win the argument and to ensure that we have a Labour government then that meets the hopes and expectations of those people. And it's, I think it's extremely straightforward, our argument now. One is, if we are to go forward, we have to have a fair taxation system. It is, we cannot survive on the inequalities, the grotesque inequalities that we have at the moment, of income and wealth within our society. And we, it's no wonder we can't fund our public services when we have a, fair, a taxation system that actually is rewarding the wealthy and actually those who don't earn their incomes. So actually, unearned income. It gets away with being taxed so lightly, whilst earned income, those income workers, the people who create the wealth, have been taxed so heavily. So we've said, as we said in the last general election, we're expanding on those points, we need a fair taxation system. And it runs like this, simple. Yes, we will increase income tax. We'll increase income tax on the top 5% of the highest earners. Not by a significant amount, but by enough to enable us then to fund things like free childcare. We will, we'll, yes, we will. We will reverse some of the issues around corporation tax, not to the level they were in 2010, but we'll reverse some of those, income, those tax cuts for corporations. Why is that? Well, the argument was if you cut the taxes to the corporations, they'll start investing. No, they won't. They're sitting on £700 billion pounds of earned income not being invested. And what's extraordinary is they're using some of that earned income to actually buy back shares, increase their bonuses as a result for those directors and the dividend is being paid out. It's extraordinary. So we said yes, we'll reverse those. But also what we'll do is we'll make sure, we'll make sure basically that the rich and the corporations pay their taxes. So we published a tax enforcement and transparency programme 18 months ago developed by the Tax Justice Campaign and Professor Prem Seeker and all that team of experts to make sure that we do that. And then I joke about it, but it's true. They keep on going on in the last election about a magic money tree that I've got. And I said to them, there is a magic money tree. It's in the Cayman Islands. I'm going to dig it up. And I'm going to dig it right here. If you look, if you look at the other elements of the fair taxation system, we've said very, very clearly as well, we will introduce the financial transaction tax. Some of us, some of the uh, people here, we've been campaigning for years for a Tobin tax. Civil society organisations have been campaigning for it. All it means is closing down some of the loopholes around stamp duty and the stamp duty taxes on derivatives and others to make sure that actually the city begins to pay its way a bit more in terms of the long term investment within our country itself. And yes, we will reverse some of the issues that have taken, some of the tax breaks that have been given to some of the highest earners with regard to inheritance tax. That will create a fair taxation system, and that funding then will be able to use to invest in our public services. It is as simple as that. And you know, if you look across Europe and elsewhere, if you look at what has happened in past history within this country, none of this is untoward, none of it is rocket science, science. none of it is actually forcing anyone to penny or anything like that. It's just a fair taxation system. And where will that money go? It will go to the development of a national education service, so that we want the NHS, we want uh, the, the NES, the National Education Service, to operate like the NHS. So education free from cradle to grave for whenever people need it. And that means making sure we bring it to free childcare, making sure we develop the Sure Start Centre, the children's centres all over again, ending the cuts to primary and secondary. And yes, when, when our kids have done everything asked of them, stayed on at school, got their results, got their A-levels, and they want to go to higher education, or training or FE, they're not burdened by debt, so yes, we will scrap tuition fees and get all the The principle has always been for us that education is a gift from one generation to another, it's not a commodity to be bought and sold. It's as simple as that. And we said also what we'll do is we'll invest in our um, National Health Service. But every meeting I've done on the NHS with health workers and others, they've been saying, by all means, invest in the NHS, end the cuts, make sure we do that. But do not put the money in the front door and allow it to go out the back door in privatisation. So yes, we will yes. end the privatisation. Yes. Yes. Also, we'll address the issue of the private finance initiatives. I, I praise the Labour government for what they did in terms of education, the investment, the investment in the NHS, etc. 
But I actually think private finance initiatives was a cul-de-sac, it was a blind alley that we went down. We need to come out of that now. And that means making sure we take the PFI back into public ownership, and in that way we have to manage them effectively and we're not drawn into this scale of privatisation that's gone on. In that way, we can invest in all this, but at the same time, we can invest to ensure actually that we have a social security system that is a real safety net. And we've had this big debate in the, in the recent weeks about universal credit, which is actually forcing people, brutally, particularly disabled people, into absolute poverty. Now, what we're saying on that is actually we want a new system. We want a system which is based upon the introduction of a real living wage, £10 an hour we calculate at the moment, the restoration of collective bargaining, sectoral collective bargaining, the restoration of trade union rights, so actually people, when they go to work, earn a decent wage and have that wage protected as a result of trade union rights and recognition. And then alongside that, you have a, you have a new social security system, which is a proper safety net. Yes, it's simplified as best we possibly can, but at the same time, it's at a level which does take people out of poverty. And we're asking for a real living wage. We want a real living wage for those people who can't work either. All of that will be, uh, will transform our society. All of it will transform our society. We put alongside that, and this is really the work that we, that we want you to do now. Fair taxation system, investment in our public services, but also what we're looking at is a national transformation. Yeah, well, yes, we will borrow. We won't borrow for day-to-day -day expenditure, but we will borrow to ensure that we invest in the capital infrastructure of our society. And what does that mean? We put forward a programme of £250 billion, pounds, which is departmental investment, over a 10-year period, matched alongside the development of National Investment Bank, which we believe will lever in another £250 billion. What that will mean is we'll have £500 billion over a 10-year programme. Where did that figure come from? It was a recommendation from the CBI and a couple of years ago the work that they did, simply to say, this is the levels of investment in our infrastructure that we need if we're going to compete in a global economy. That £250 billion of departmental spending, it will go in terms of growing our economy. In terms of growing our economy and infrastructure, in terms of road and rail, alternative energy, but also tackling the fourth industrial revolution, and that means the digital infrastructure and artificial investment in new technology, artificial intelligence, and robotics, where we're so far behind other European and other and global competitors on that. And what we're doing about that at the moment is touring around the country. Every other Saturday we're doing economic conferences in individual constituencies to talk about how that local economy can be transformed by that investment. And it's interesting what's coming forward. First, the first priority in most areas is actually to tackle the housing crisis. So we've said, yes, we will. Part of that investment will be about building a million new homes. And we've said that a million new homes over a five-year programme, the issue for us is actually making sure those home, homes are truly affordable. And that does mean funding local government. Yes, lifting the borrowing cap, but properly funding local government so we can build council houses once again. <laughs> do that and at the same time give the opportunities for local authorities as well to look at the rent controls in particular areas wherever they think is sufficient we'll be able to we think we have to lift up some of the housing house, the burden of housing costs off people over a period of time and provide them with a decent living as well a decent uh, roof over their heads but alongside that what we want people to be doing in the local constituencies now is working up their local economic plans in terms of where should that investment go should it be on education and training, and where should that be? What organisations are fit for purpose to do that? What infrastructure development should happen? Is it about the digital top, uh, infrastructure and architecture in a particular area? Is it about rail? Is it about alternative energy sources and alternative uh, energy programmes that can be developed in a particular area? In that way, we will grow the economy, but we'll grow the economy on the basis of developing an economy, yes, which is, first of all, prosperous, but also sustainable both economically and environmentally. But this is the difference between us and Tories and always, always will be. It's where that prosperity is shared by everybody. That's socialist practice. It means basically that when we invest, yes, it is about growing the economy, but it's growing in a sustainable way, particularly about tackling climate change. But all this will come to naught unless that prosperity is shared across our society and we tackle the inequalities that you'll be talking about later in, in the discussions today.
Finally, let me just say, say this, because I'm going too long, which is, immediately we have to address the issue of Brexit. Now, as a party, we campaign to remain. We lost the referendum on that basis, so we respect the referendum result. But that doesn't mean to say we allow our country to be hurtled into a situation which undermines our economy and undermines the ability of people to have a decent living in this country as well. So we've been arguing consistently now that we need a, a government that can negotiate a deal in which we have a close and collaborative relationship with our European partners, that we develop ideas about uh, how we develop that economy, <coughs> not on the neoliberal dominance that has dominated Europe overall, including our own country, but one in which we grow a prosperous economy, tackling climate change and at the same time tackling the grotesque inequalities that exist both in our country and across Europe. We believe that we can establish that new relationship with Europe, proximity to the single market, involvement in a customs union, and at the same time involvement in all those institutions that actually, we believe, create the necessary standards of if you like, protection for consumers, protection of the environment, and protection of employment rights as well, that will enable us to then have that harmonious relationship with our European partners. We think we can negotiate that. We don't believe that could ever be negotiated under the Tories. In fact, some of them are conspiring for us to crash out of Europe on the basis of a, a, a no-deal Brexit, and they have these fantasies about us being almost like Singapore on the edge of Europe, a low tax, a low tax and a tax haven for, for many investors, etc. <coughs> We'll do everything we possibly can in these coming weeks to basically say that if the government brings back a deal that is acceptable that protects the jobs and the economy, yes, we would support it. But there is no likelihood of doing that under Theresa May and this administration. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, it's hardly likely that they'll be able to well, get something through their own cabinet, let alone their own party and let alone parliament. So on that basis, we've said, if they can't bring back a deal, there's a simple solution. They should move over and let us do the negotiations. And if they <laughs> and if they're not willing to do that, we should have a general election. And in that way, people can choose the team and they can address the issue itself. If they won't give us a general election, we've kept on the we've kept on the agenda, the opportunity, we've kept on the table the opportunity of a of a further vote. But my view is actually we need a general election. This, this crew, this party, this Tory party are not fit to govern. Yeah. They're not fit to govern either of the issues of Brexit or any other issues that, tackle, that need to be tackled within our society at the moment. And the sooner they go, the better. And as Jeremy said at the conference, and we've said time and time again, if they want a general election, just bring it on. Bring it on as rapidly as possible and let's get out there. Because it isn't just about changing the government, it's also about changing the individual MPs. We can't tolerate a Tory MP in Gloucester any longer. What we need is someone as a local I think we need someone who's a local candidate, who knows the local community, who'll be an independent voice standing up for that community. In other words, we need Fran elected at this next election. And we'll do it. <laughs>